Panera's reputation keeps taking hits lately. First, it was their lemonade we covered that since then has landed itself in three different lawsuits, but now they find themselves wrapped up in yet another controversy, and their shady business might lead to the law redefining what fast food is forever. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Food Theory, the show that's baked fresh every week. Speaking of baked fresh, Panera is the talk of the town again, and not because of their lemonade this time. In case you haven't caught our episode on that, make sure to go watch it right after this. But long story short, Panera's uber-caffeinated lemonade made waves last year when a spotlight shined on just how much caffeine they were stuffing into their drink without any sort of warning for their customers. This landed it in the middle of two lawsuits in connection to two deaths, and one more tacked on earlier this year when another person alleged that they've begun experiencing long-term health problems due to the drink. These are still ongoing, so nothing's been definitively settled, but Panera has since lowered the caffeine amount in the drinks and issued warnings about the caffeine content itself. This time around, though, they're in the news for shady business going on off their menu. But there's something bigger at work in this latest debacle with Panera that can literally change the landscape of fast food for good. All because of one little bakery. Or fast food place. Or fast bakery. See, that, my friends, is what we're going to be exploring today. This Panera conspiracy is just the first domino to fall in a line that might lead you to paying more for worse food. So where did all this start? Well, late last year, a law passed in California that raises the minimum wage for fast food workers from the state minimum of $16 an hour to 20. On the surface, it looks great. It helps provide a more livable wage in a time when things are getting more and more expensive. And there are other provisions built in, like the establishment of a fast food council that will act as advocates kits for workers' rights to protect them in the future. However, some eagle-eyed reporters found that there's a loophole in the law that will exempt Panera from this, and almost exclusively them. Obviously, this led to people asking questions as to why something like this would be added to the bill, and the closer people looked, the worse it got for Panera. To understand that, though, we gotta take a closer look at the law itself. Which, by the way, made me laugh more than it should have because of the very real fast food council I mentioned. In reality, it's just a group of members that set industry working conditions but in my mind, all I could picture was a Jedi Council composed of Ronald, the King, Wendy, and the terrifying Jack in the Box wearing ceremonial hoods in a dark room. I don't even know what they would talk about. Maybe how much sick gear they can make their floors. But back to the point, to settle what employers would fall under this category, the bill specifies exactly what a fast food restaurant is. To be considered fast food, the restaurant has to have, quote, more than 60 establishments nationally that share a common brand or that are characterized by standardized options for decor, market, marketing, packaging, products, and services, and which are primarily engaged in providing food and beverages for immediate consumption on or off premises where patrons generally order or select items and pay before consuming with limited or no table service. Basically, all that to say that they should all look the same, sell the same food that you pay for and then eat with no table service. So far, so good. I mean, that seems like a fairly comprehensive definition. The carve out comes a little further down where it states that a place wouldn't be considered fast food if the establishment operates and continues to operate, quote, a bakery that produces for sale on the establishment's premises bread, end quote, which is also pretty extensively defined in the Code of Federal Regulations, but boils down to a yeast leavened dough mixed with some sort of moistening agent, like water or milk, and another leavening agent, like yeast. There's a whole lot of wiggle room within this definition, so that pretty much every variation of bread slots in. The final big point in the bill states that the establishment also has to sell its bread as a standalone menu item, which means the buns at McDonald's, for example, wouldn't count. I mean, for crying out loud, their buns barely skirt by the definition of bread. Who in their right mind is going to want to buy them separately? Looking at the text of the bill, there's seemingly no reason why Panera wouldn't fit neatly in that bakery category. They certainly make and sell their bread as a standalone item on the menu. Actually, if we take that definition at face value, it wouldn't be the only fast food place to fall there. Jimmy John's, a national chain that specializes in subs, can also be defined as a bakery, according to this. Jimmy John's bakes their bread fresh every day, but unlike some other sandwich chains like Subway, their bread is actually for sale on their menu as a completely separate item. You can see it right there under the sides. Fresh baked French baguette. So where Subway or Jersey Mike's or whatever other place would not apply for this exemption because the bill clearly states the bread can't be for sale as part of another menu item, like a sandwich, Jimmy John's does. And it doesn't matter that Jimmy John's doesn't call themselves a bakery because by the mere fact that they produce bread for sale, you can easily 
easily make the argument that they're just as much of a bakery as Panera. Despite that, Panera is the one being singled out right now. Critics claim that the carve out in the law is tailor made for Panera and people are insinuating it shouldn't even be considered a bakery. Seems a bit odd considering it's right there in the name, Panera Bread. Even going further back when it was first founded in St. Louis, Panera Bread was first known as a St. Louis bread company. In fact, it still is in a hundred locations spread around the greater St. Louis area. When it started in the 90s, it was nothing more than a bakery actually. No muffies, no tomato soups, no sandwiches, just good old fashioned sourdough. I actually didn't know this, but in researching for this episode, I found out that they still use the same sourdough starter to this day. That is impressive. If you don't know what a starter is, it's basically a unique culture of bacteria and yeast that acts as the leavening agent when making bread. Keeping a starter is like keeping a pet. It's alive, you have to care for it, even feed it. But if it dies, you could just try again with another. So it's less like a pet and more like a Tamagotchi. I know that reference ages me a bit, but the power of nostalgia bringing those back makes me happy beyond measure. Obviously, if it was as simple as that, I wouldn't even be here though. So what's all the hubbub about? Well, it's the fact that a carve out that so perfectly takes Panera out of the running is even put into the law to begin with. To observers, Panera is being given special treatment by not being lumped in with other fast food places and not having to pay their employees more as a result. That assumption isn't as shark jumpy as you might think. There was a lot of convenient coincidence in Panera being the one to benefit here. Billionaire businessman Greg Flynn, who owns over two dozen Panera locations in California, just so happens to have gone to high school with Governor Newsom and, oh yeah, is a major contributor to Newsom's campaigns for re-election. The accusations being thrown out are those of pay to play politics, which is the idea of people giving financial support to a political candidate with the expectation of favorable treatment in return. If this sounds like a bribe to you, but there is a legitimate reason as to why Panera isn't a bakery, at least according to the bill. Panera doesn't make their dough fresh in every location. The bill's exact text says that a bakery has to produce their bread, and technically they're not. They're just baking it. And that's true. Like we established, Panera gets their dough delivered frozen from a central hub to be baked fresh every day, but not made from scratch. By that standard, almost no large chain like it would be considered a bakery. Prêt à manger, another popular spot similar to Panera, also distributes their doughs to their locations for them to be baked fresh every day. In fact, it would be against their best interests as large chains to have each location make their dough fresh. And it all comes back to the mother dough. The starter I mentioned earlier, maintaining the same one in a central hub allows you to essentially make the same bread over and over. You can make a bread with it, then a year later or in a completely different location, make the recipe again, chuck in some of the starter, let the bacteria and yeast infect the bread mixture, and voila, you have the same tasting loaf. Places as large as Panera tend to have this system of shipping frozen dough from a central mother dough because it's a form of quality control. While they could take bits of their mother dough and give it to every franchisee so they can make their own dough fresh every day, that introduces a bunch of variables all of a sudden that can affect how your bread tastes from location to location, depending on things like how the owners store the starter, how they take care of it, and so many other things that can make their product become inconsistent. When you're a chain as large as Panera, inconsistency is your biggest enemy. Now, whether Panera ends up being exempt or not will have to be decided by the courts when it all goes into effect next month. I'm no judge or lawyer or even law student, but I have watched the series Suits in its entirety at least four times, so I feel qualified enough to say that this isn't a clear-cut situation. Newsom and his team have even come out to agree with me and say that Panera actually isn't exempt and will have to up their wages to $20 like all the other fast food chains. Now, like I mentioned, it's not up to them, but the courts. But even if Panera was exempt, from paying their workers more, every other fast food place would instantly become more attractive to any prospective employee and Panera would have to up their wages to be competitive anyway. Unless you live in a town with just the one Panera and no other fast food options, in which case your biggest concern should be getting out of that town. This is called wage pressure. If every other restaurant is paying more to their employees, Panera would have no incentive to pay a lower wage. Nobody would wanna work there and the business would tank. So at the end of the day, despite potential shady business going on, it looks like Panera won't be getting any special treatment after all. Even if they were, they'd have no reason to pay less than their competitors because they wouldn't be able to get anyone to work for them if they could just go down the block to McDonald's and get paid more. Just the way the bread bowl crumbles, I guess. But hey, that's not the end of the story. Because setting a precedent like this could have ripple effects that spread wide, especially as more and more labor rights advocates fight for fair wages across the country. Right now, the topic of conversations is fast food and bakeries. But one aspect of Panera that isn't under 
scrutiny at the moment is their fast casual label. For the moment, fast casual restaurants like Chipotle and Panera aren't legally separated from McDonald's or Burger King. That said, it could very well change. Going back to Newsom and Flynn, while they denied talking about Panera specifically getting an exception, Greg Flynn did say they met to discuss carve outs in the law for fast casual restaurants. And Newsom's communications director echoed this, saying the bakery clause was about defining fast food and fast casual restaurants. How that was meant to do that is honestly beyond me. But okay, Panera after all does fall into the legal category of fast food. But colloquially, Panera is definitely seen more as a fast casual place. Even on their own website, they refer to themselves as a fast casual restaurant. They have, for the most part, better quality food, a better sit down experience, and a higher price range that takes it away from the likes of the Burger Kings and Taco Bells and puts it in the company of the Chipotle's and the Shake Shacks. Those are typically the go-tos for separating the two categories, but not from any legal point of view. The definition I gave earlier of fast food restaurants easily describes fast casual restaurants as a whole as well. So what does separate them? Panera, as much as McDonald's, has a standardized decor, marketing, and line of products. And in both places, you select your items and pay before consuming with limited table service. Does it all come down to the drive-thru? Well, not every McDonald's has a drive-thru. Fast casual restaurants tend to put more emphasis on fresh ingredients and quality overall, but that doesn't exclude all fast food restaurants either. The answer isn't easy to find and has been debated for some time. It's been a harmless debate before, something you fight with your friends over while you slurp some soup and eat a passable at best half sandwich at Panera. But thanks to Greg Flynn and the controversy, it may soon need to be legally defined. And depending on the conditions that separate them, like one category being forced to pay more to its employees than the other, we may see these large corporations scrambling to lower their own quality so that they can call themselves fast food and potentially save millions of dollars by skimping out on wages. Heck, Panera is already loosening their ingredient standards, removing signs that include grass-fed, pasture-raised, no antibiotics ever, or any mention of hormones. Whether it's because they're going public as a company soon or because they're bracing for this future definition remains to be seen. While this dystopian situation may seem like a crazy hypothetical, thanks to one Panera franchisee's shady tactics, it may all too well become a reality. But hey, that's just a theory. A food theory. Bon appetit. <laughs> And hey, if you like this episode and want to see more about Panera's shady antics, go check out our episode on their lemonade on the left. Or if you're in the mood for some more fast food conspiracies, check out our episode on the conspiracy that ended Kentucky Fried Chicken. And as always, I'll see you next week.